Hey, everybody, Jonathan Baylor and April Perry back in action with another saying show. April, how are you doing today? So great. So excited to be here. April, well, this is a, we got to start to show out with a sense of urgency because as we promised at the end of last show, we we're talking about the, the horrible burden of childhood obesity, mm -hmm. emotional tolls that takes, and you gave some amazing guidance around action we can take to help the problem, not making it worse, empowering people with choices and some great next actions. And I want to talk about in this episode, why it is important to do that now right now today like today like right after you finish <laughs> listening to this podcast right after you finish watching this video why you need to this evening set aside some time to start these conversations and does that sound okay oh it sounds awesome <laughs> you might have to reel me in during this one because i'm gonna get i'm gonna get a little bit amped up so the the why now so the very first thing i didn't have a chance to get to this in our last episode so i've got to bring it up now is this idea and, and, and you said it, and you said that you hear parents saying this, and this is, I feel like a moral imperative to debunk this because it is false and it is literally slowly killing people. The idea that your kid is going to grow out of mm -hmm. unhealthy eating habits or that because they're a small person, that their body is somehow uniquely able to handle toxic substances. So those are both patently false. Yeah, but okay, I used to believe this. So let me just to give it some perspective from a mother who, I mean, I'm college educated. I've grown up in the United States taking nutrition classes at school, things like this. Why did I believe this? Okay, here's, here's why, as I kind of look back. Number one, the term baby fat. You hear that all the time. Babies are born a little extra fat. Then sometimes as your children are seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, you just think, oh, it's kind of baby fat. As they're getting ready to go through puberty, it'll just kind of fall off and they'll get taller. And as they get taller, it will just kind of help them even out. I don't know. That's just kind of something that that I was expecting, or maybe I was just hoping. <laughs> I was just kidding myself, just hoping that that would happen. So that's, I think, the first reason. Um, then also, you don't always see it right away manifesting itself in young children. So for example, I have four children. Only one of my four children actually started struggling with her weight. The other three children were totally fine. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, they're all eating junk food and they're not getting overweight. I'm sure they're fine because I don't see it right now. And as a mother, I mean, every day someone comes to me with something like, my pinky is hurting right here. My knee hurts. I have this weird itch on the left side of my head. I mean, there's just random things that your kids are coming to all the time. And so you're always assessing. Okay, do we need to go to the ER? Do I need to call the doctor? Do I need to go buy ointment? Do I need to get a bandaid? I mean, that's going through my mind all the time, trying to assess what my children's problems are. When you have young children who are eating fruit roll-ups and sugary yogurt and candy and suckers and Twix and Snickers and all of the things that I used to buy at the grocery store, they are not coming to you and complaining about anything. They are smiling, they are thanking you, they are happy, they're asking for more. And so in my mind, that's not putting up any red flags. That looks like pure joy that my children are experiencing. So then if you tell me, well, do you know that what's bringing your children pure joy is actually killing your kids? I would just think you were crazy. So, and it's, there you it's go. Just, and, no, and I so appreciate you bringing that perspective in here, April, because it's true, and I, I want, I mean, everyone who's listened to this show for a long time knows this, but if you're a new listener, I want to reiterate, we are never here to say, I mean, the message here is you've been lied to, you've been given improper information, you've been victimized, and now you can take control back. So this is never to be wagging a finger. It's never right. been to say you should have known. Frankly, no. What's been happening in the nutrition and wellness world is analogous to what happened in the world of smoking 100 years ago, which was, uh, oh, cigarettes are fine, just keep smoking. And then if everyone got lung cancer, now the, the authorities are like, why do you all have lung cancer? Well, you told us smoking wasn't bad for us. Right. And that's why I actually love working with you, Jonathan, because I never feel like you're judging me for things that I've done or things that I'm still doing or trying to learn that you're really understanding that, yes, I've just I've grown up not knowing what the right facts are, but I'm ready to learn. So I'm a good student. <laughs> <laughs> so so let's so let's learn. So let's let's break some of those the old paradigms that we were given, the old models that we were given, and let's replace them with empowering modern science. So the 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 they're they're small. The baby fat 
small person, they'll grow out of it. So let's let's talk about that one because it's a great one. So first point I want to make around that is, so that's kind of true for men, but it's not at all true for women, right? Okay. So when 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 little boys hit adolescence and start producing testosterone, so not to get too scientific, but testosterone is an anabolic hormone, right? You hear about okay. anabolic steroids as people inject. So that will meant like a, a, a healthy man will get, will drop his body fat percentage when he hits puberty. Okay. Now the opposite thing is true for women, right? Like when you think about when a woman hits puberty, estrogen levels go so up. not fair. Well, well, and, and so women gain fat. That doesn't necessarily, they may, they gain, let's say undesirable fat. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, a, the, the breast is fat, right? That right. it all, you gain it all at one period of time in your life. <laughs> okay. So, so, I mean, it is kind of true that you can grow out of baby fat, but this is not, as you know, it's not so much about the fat. It's about yeah. the, the health and that ties into the, well, there's plenty of people. There's naturally thin people. There's, there's kids that eat junk food and they don't get overweight. So then we sometimes say, oh, if you're not overweight, you must be healthy right. and this must not be harming you. And so I, I want to just give a quick two empowering points about that, because that is the one that I think is the most dangerous. So two examples. One is if your child starts smoking or if your spouse starts smoking or if anyone you know starts smoking, not only will they not gain weight, but they will lose weight. Mm, okay. Smoking is an appetite suppressant. Mm -hmm. And it actually has been shown that we talk about your set point. It will actually slightly drop your set point. This is why when people quit smoking, they almost always gain weight. Okay. So you can smoke cigarettes and not gain weight and you'll actually lose weight. Does that mean they're not doing any damage to you? Right. Of course not. Of course not. So, but yeah. it's, you know, when we, when all we hear about is calories mm -hmm. and all we have da, 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 it's very easy to think, yeah. oh, that's an unfair comparison. We know it's not right. I mean, yeah. when you put chemicals into your body, whether those chemicals are coming from something that has calories, AKA food, or something that doesn't have calories, AKA cigarettes. And I guess that comparison isn't even fair because there's plenty of food. Diet Coke doesn't have any calories in it. It's got a lot of chemicals in it though. So what is it more like, food or a cigarette? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't just use weight as a proxy for health. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then just the one other comparison I wanna make is the the small body. Like, oh, they're, they're small. They can, they, can, they can grow out of it. Just a yeah. really empowering thing, I think. So. When is your child's body the smallest? When it's not born. <laughs> yes. okay. Okay. And, 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 and when do we go out of our way, no matter what else is going on in our mm -hmm. life, no matter what society says, no matter what social circumstance we're in, we somehow, uh, and women all over the world, um, magically learn how to dramatically change their diet in all situations, all the time, always, they just know it and they make it happen for nine months because they know that that teeny tiny body is uniquely at risk for toxic stuff. Okay, that doesn't change as soon as that body mm -hmm. comes out of your body. It's just as true. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, but I have to interject here because when I was pregnant, I ate terribly because everything <laughs> else made me sick. So here's here's the story though. Like I remember sitting in my doctor's office and I was reading a pregnancy magazine that he had there on the table. And it said, here's what should be in your fridge if you want to help build a strong body for your baby. And it was listing things like kale and eggs and you know all these vegetables, all this great food and everything. And I remember looking at that and I felt nauseated and sick to my stomach and I just kind of ate whatever I could. So the intention was there and the desire was there, but I just have to bring some reality because as a pregnant woman, I, yeah, it was kind of embarrassing, but I ate, <laughs> well, but. <laughs> well, well, let, me, well, let, me, let me caveat what I said, but let me put it this way. I bet you avoided all secondhand smoke yes. and I bet you avoided alcohol and like things. roller coasters and you know <laughs> anything that they told me not to do i didn't do but yes i think going back to that intention it's hard but see this is where i feel like the habits that i had for myself as a pregnant woman i mean if i knew what i know now i would have tried a little harder <laughs> when I was pregnant. but 
one thing that is different that I just maybe want to bring up, see what your take on it is. I remember my doctor, I went to him and I said, the only thing I can eat right now is frozen Capri Sun. Like that's all I can eat. I'm just eating it out of the package. I freeze them and I watch Wonder Woman. Like that's what I did when I was pregnant. And one thing that my doctor said is he said, your baby's body will grow, but what will happen is it will take all the nutrients somewhere out of your body. So even if you can only eat junk, your, your body is not going to create a baby out of junk. It's going to pull the nutrients from you somewhere. So that I think is really interesting because once your baby is born, now that can't happen. The nutrients aren't coming from the air. The baby is not in your body anymore pulling nutrients from your body. Now you have to decide what to put in the baby's mouth. And that's that's a little bit of a different thing. So anyway, any that's thoughts a, on that? That's, a, that's an incredible point, April, where you, you uh, I never actually connected those dots before, but when you've got a child in utero, it has a safety net. And that safety net is just by way of example, yeah. if there's insufficient protein, your body knows to break down your muscle tissue and to feed those amino acids to your baby. It knows if it doesn't have enough, the baby doesn't have enough calcium to extract that from your bones yeah. and to give it to that child. But you're right, because when that little person leaves the utero, uter, utero leaves the uterus and enters the, the real world, there is no safety net. And then that's maybe that's why we start to see, you know, despite maybe some some sub some insane eating habits during pregnancy, we're able to have a child which yeah. appears to be relatively healthy. But once that safety net's gone, we have a world where we have today, which is more than 40 million children under the age of five are overweight they don't they don't have that safety net anymore well and i think what's been interesting now is that this just brings a whole nother dimension to parenthood and to motherhood because now instead of me giving my baby everything that he or she needs by default i have to make a choice to do it and i think that's why this is so urgent right now is because there are way too many parents who don't even know that they have to make this choice they think that by default society is going to help them raise healthy children with all the sugar and everything that they're going to be fed and all the things that are going to be marketed to them. And I think parents need to realize no one out there is going to make sure your child grows up healthy and strong besides you. Like you're the one who's going to make it happen. And if you're kind of closing your eyes to it and just saying, well, I'm sure they'll be fine. We'll just give them whatever. Okay. I mean, that, that can work. They can live, they can survive. But when it comes to, childhood obesity when it comes to living long healthy lives you don't have any guarantees april you literally have blown my mind because i've been talking about this for uh over a decade now and i've all i've my argument has always been hey we know the most important time is when a baby's in utero but you you have completely changed my mind because like exactly what you're saying mm -hmm. as soon as the child is so if you if you think so here's a little thing to help after 40 years of misinformation or 30 years of misinformation, if you think that when a baby is in utero, that nutrition is important, most people do, mm -hmm. wouldn't you agree that based on what you just said, April, you know, what, what April just taught us, that since there is no fallback, since it can't extract nutrients from the mother anymore, that as important as nutrition is to a baby when it's in utero, it's even more important after the baby's born like i i that's i never thought that's pretty you just you just blew my <laughs> mind that's, that's awesome that's awesome well i think it's it's exciting though to think how much power we have i think that instead of feeling guilty or feeling awful oh my goodness i'm making brownies every day or i have so much junk food all around me or i don't even know what's healthy there's so many ways that we as moms can decide to feel guilty and just as parents where we don't need to feel that way i think instead what we want to do is say okay well then what can we do we have this opportunity to nourish our children and give them everything that they need. And I didn't know how strong this, this desire to give my children everything would be until I had children. And clearly I can't give them everything they want all the time they want. You know, we have to teach them how to work and how to, you know, do a lot for themselves. But I will say, if someone comes to me and says, okay, this is your child. If the nurse had, had come to me in the hospital when they were teaching me, you know, how to nurse my baby and said, this is your child. These are the nutrients your child needs. This is the best way to help them to get all these vegetables, the proteins, the whole food fats. If, if a nurse had come to me and said, 
These foods will help your baby to thrive his or her whole life. Will you do this for your baby? Absolutely, of course, 100%. And I would consider that my privilege to do that for my child every single day. And I think that's what we're inviting families to do now is saying, we'll show you. If the nurse in the hospital didn't teach you or nobody ever taught you, we'll show you now what foods to give yourself and your children so that you can all thrive. And I think that's exciting. That's an exciting challenge I'm willing to take. It's an incredibly exciting challenge, April. And the good news is it's not, it's definitely not about, hey, obviously this is important, but I think people can hear it's important as, oh my gosh, if I'm not a 10 out of 10 all the time, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm killing my baby. And, and let's, let me, let, let's just, let's put that to rest really quickly, right. which is there is, there is. So think about grandma and grandma's grandma and how that they fed their children, right? They baked goods exist. They existed. It wasn't as if there was no such thing as baked goods. But when we yeah. think about what didn't exist, like think about what people ate for breakfast a hundred years ago, there mm. wasn't sugar soaked cereal. There mm. wasn't fruit juice there wasn't soda there wasn't fruit roll-ups there wasn't gogurt in a tube so i mean honestly i don't i mean we can't prove this but i would be in the 1960s people ate insanely right there was insane eating going on in the 1960s and obesity was super rare i mean it was just like mm. one in 10, one in 20 kids were overweight. It was, if you had a classroom of third graders, it would be, it would be odd for any of the children to be overweight. It just wasn't seen back then. It wasn't because everyone was eating perfectly. It's because people weren't eating these really just toxic, addictive, processed, garbage so instead of maybe hearing this podcast and saying oh my gosh i have to revamp everything i have to throw everything in my house away oh my gosh i'm a failure <laughs> so now we're saying just like if you could just just uh, you know this won't necessarily get you to optimal health but maybe that's not the goal right now the goal is progress not perfection just try to eat a little bit more like like grant what grandma would have served <laughs> her kids right so if grandma wouldn't have served this if this didn't exist it would grandma. Mm -hmm. and then of course when you get to that point we can talk about how to make it even better but what do you think about that as a goal because that answers the question about like well what about birthdays and what about weddings and what about halloween <laughs> yeah, i mean you can eat on those days but that's i mean the average american's getting 60 yeah. percent of their calories from stuff that didn't exist 20 right, years ago. Right. right. And I think that just a really simple next action that we can give to, to families right now is just double the number of vegetables that you're currently eating in your family. Like double it just once. Then, you know, maybe in a couple of weeks, double it again. <laughs> Increase until you get up to, you know, about 10 servings a day for each family member. But just this idea of doubling that's that's so easy to do. I mean, with children, it's like, hey, put out some carrot sticks. It's amazing. You put chopped vegetables on a platter after school, it disappears. Yesterday, we had cucumber, cauliflower, and carrots. And for some reason, no one in the family likes to chop vegetables except me. <laughs> so I seem to be the one who kind of helps coordinate it. But we're helping teach everyone else how to do it, which has been awesome. But just putting out a plate of raw, non-starchy vegetables or serving an extra salad with dinner or having a green smoothie in the morning, doing something like that just to start getting more vegetables in because then you're gonna start crowding out the food that isn't good for you and the children just, they'll eat it. I mean, one funny story is my daughter, Aaliyah, 15, she was doing a potluck for the last day of school during the finals week of high school. And this was a few months ago. And she said, hey, everyone's signing up to bring a bunch of junk food. And she said, mom, can I bring some vegetables? And I said, oh, sure. So we bought, brought extra vegetables, put them on a platter, shook them to school. And she actually took pictures on the sly of her friends eating vegetables and all enjoying them. And she said, mom, everyone loved it. They ate everything that I brought to school. So I think that we've proven that children will eat what's in front of them. If you can work together to put more of that, those great vegetables out there, that's a great step, a very simple next action you can apply today. I love that next action of just double up those non-starchy vegetables. And April, do you mind if I add, if you, if I add one more? Absolutely. Uh, and so the the so that's about what to add. And I'm gonna I'm gonna re recommend a subtle and sly way of of one thing. I would beg. I would argue that if this, if I could wave a magic wand and this just disappeared, the obesity epidemic and diabetes epidemic would be gone. Okay. And that's liquid sugar. 
So mm. any source of liquid sugar. So that mm. includes soda, that includes Capri Suns, even the frozen type. <laughs> that, includes, that includes fruit juice. Now, what's not going to work, right? What's not going to work is just to say, no one gets to drink soda anymore, right? Mm. That, that, so that's not what I'm suggesting. Okay. But what I am suggesting is that we find simple ways to maybe substitute that. So mm -hmm. a subtle way of doing this is with like fruit juice is actually very easy because you could take, you've got fruit juice, you're used to pouring a full glass of fruit juice. Tomorrow, can you pour a glass of seven eighths fruit juice and yeah. one eighth water? Yeah. And then yeah. can you do that for four days? Mm -hmm. And then on day five, can you just drop one eighth of the fruit juice out, add one more eighth of water? Yeah, and it then, works. You know, and then pretty soon what you can serve and enjoy, mm -hmm. and because I know thousands of people who've made this mm -hmm. transition successfully, is you'll take a blender, you'll put one strawberry in it, and a bunch of water, you'll blend it up, and now you have strawberry infused water, and everyone loves it because it's not just boring old water. So just mm -hmm. try to think of those creative ways to just yeah. slowly minimize the liquid sugar in your diet. How's that sound? I love it. I'm gonna actually do that. I haven't, I've done the watered down juice, but I haven't done the strawberry infused water. So fun next action, I love it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this chat as much as I did. My mind has been blown and hopefully your, yours has as well. So remember, stay sane.